Hi, welcome to a new video, um, a new vlog. I'm, if you didn't see the past vlog, which I'll put somewhere up here, um, I made my way to Rome, to my parents' house for Christmas, and we're here for four more days or something. So anyway, that explains the location if you weren't, if you didn't watch the last video. Maybe I'll just crouch down here. So I thought I would just start with current reading. Um, I got a few books for Christmas and also I went to my favorite bookstore here in Rome. It's called Almost Corner Bookshop, if you're ever in Rome. And I love it. It's not secondhand, it's firsthand, but they just have a really great selection and it's all English books. Um, so I got a few things for myself there, meaning six books. Um, and two of which I'm kind of focusing on in this video because I was drawn to them this morning and then I realized that they're really the same theme. So these are two books by French authors about their fathers. So seems to be the kind of vibe of the video is books about one's father. So the first one that I actually already read this morning over my coffee, I started and finished it, um, is Edouard Louis' Who Killed My Father. This is translated by Lauren Stein. Very sparse on the page, um, so it's about 80 pages, but it feels like reading 30 pages because it's quite spacious and um, broken up into very easily digestible um, fragments, although like not so easily digestible in the sense that it's pretty raw and hard to read um, or hard to swallow. This is about um, the author's father, his relationship with his father, a lot about poverty. Um, it's really like he's uh, sort of looking, now that it's sort of the end of his father's life, he's looking at his life and the kind of disadvantage that he was born into in severe poverty in France and basically all the ways that the government, the system, and society killed his father from the beginning made it impossible for him to kind of have a normal happy life and that obviously extended to Edouard Louis life as the son of this man. They have a really fraught relationship. Um, he says at one point, several years later, once I'd fled the village and gone to live in Paris, when I went out at night and met men in bars and they'd ask me how I got along with my family. It's an odd question, but they ask it. I would always tell them I hated my father. It wasn't true. I knew I loved you, but I felt a need to tell other people that I hated you. Why? Is it normal to be ashamed of loving? father was born into like a very violent household um and he, so he kind of he talks a lot about like masculinity toxic masculinity um the inability to be vulnerable and how that can really eat away at you and edward louis is a um, gay man so that was a difficult situation to be in in his house. Social poverty, social class, shame, shame around poverty, especially shame in an ultra masculine man who who was all the time trying to run away from or cover up how poor they were. Edouard Louis also really is calling out the names of different governments and politicians in France who he holds completely responsible for the fact that any marginalized groups were just doomed from the beginning and made and their life made harder and harder and harder by the people in in politics um, and so he really uses his book to hold those people accountable and he writes why do we never name these names in a biography and then he really names all of them and and kind of is writing to his father saying that these are really the people that are responsible for your unfortunate life. Um, so very interesting, very short, small. I always feel with his writing, it's really punchy and really honest and raw. I do think it, that his books actually could be a bit longer. Um, 
that he could go deeper, could go even more. It's a crushing book. You feel that, you feel the um, sense of suffocation and being completely neglected by um, society, uh, people that live in poverty in the countryside. Yeah, very interesting. And then this is A Man's Place by Annie Ono, who's also a um, French writer. She just won the Nobel Prize for Literature. Um, so her books are again making a kind of round. Um, I haven't read this one. This is her book, her reflection on her father, who was also barely educated and strictly was working in labor and grown into this hard, practical man who showed his family little affection. Um, and like the shame she revealed, it says here, Erno reveals the shame that haunted him throughout his life, which is exactly what is being explored in here. So, and I do think he's very influenced by Annie Erno's writing. I have not read this yet. Um, so that'll be the next one that I read for this video. And then on the fiction side, I have been reading don't Look Now by Daphne du Maurier. She wrote the famous book Rebecca, um, which be has become a kind of chilling, haunting classic, which I have yet to read, actually. Um, but this is a collection of stories, stories selected and with an introduction by Patrick McGrath. Love this cover. It's wild. It's what drew it drew me to it on the New York Review of Books website. Lesser known short stories of hers. I've read the first two, uh, the first one being Don't Look Now and the second one being The Birds, which you will know as being adapted to a film by Alfred Hitchcock that she was very disappointed in. Um, and the, the story is brilliant. So I, I can confidently say two stories in that it's the best short story collection that I've ever read, um, especially in the kind of creepy context. It's not gimmicky, it's not um, kitsch, it's not just really good. Like, it's really good storytelling. Um, and I can see why the first two stories have been adapted to film because it's very visual. Um, I just really enjoyed both of them so far the two that I read. This one is called Escort. Um, with a short story collection, I'm, I'm not sure like how cover to cover I will read this, if I will jump in and out or just get sucked into the whole thing. Um, but very psychological, which are the kind of things that I actually like to read if I'm reading like pure fiction for story. I like when it has something psychologically fucked up in it. Uh, so that's been a really fun, um, enjoyable thing to be reading, <laughs> whatever. I'm gonna go do a little vintage shopping. Um, there's a place in Rome called Mercatino where you can buy a lot of, um, like antiques, furniture, um, picture frames, like everything. And my father really loves it. So we're gonna go with him and there is a clothing section in the back and Ohad and I are looking forward to that. So that's all for now. Um, I'll talk to you later. Bye. It's very It's a bag, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. a cloth bag mm -hmm. that folds up and fits inside like a carry. Hello everyone, it's Wednesday. Um, I am heading out 
but I just wanted to give you a really short update that I'm about halfway through A Man's Place by Annie Ono. It's a little stained because I bought some um, secondhand shoes yesterday and they were a little dirty and I threw them in the same bag as this book. I'm enjoying it. I'll talk to you about it later. It's a beautiful sunny day. It's almost January and it's sunny. I'm dressed like I'm in the secret history. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is Friday. It's our last day in Rome. Um, we fly tonight around three in the morning for the airport. We go to the airport at three. This is, I'm finishing the vlog by saying that I finished this morning um, Annie Elno's A Man's Place. And I forgot to mention that it's translated by Tanya Leslie by Fitzcarraldo. I must say something with Annie Elno's writing that I've read this is like my third or fourth book of hers. There is always something that doesn't fully work for me or doesn't like fully um, nuzzle itself inside me. Um, and that feels like really weird to say about, you know, the winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature. And I absolutely see the importance of her writing and her style of memoir. But every time I finish a book of hers, I think, I liked it and I totally see its merit, but it's never like a fully like, that's gonna be on my top books or I'm gonna tell everyone in my life that they need to read this book. Um, so it, it doesn't like touch me in that way ever, except for the end of this book. Um, it, the beginning and the end are kind of the death of her father and the middle, the whole chunk of most of the book is about his life and the business that he runs with his with her mother. They run like a cafe and store together in France. Shame that he feels throughout his life of his social status and just being aware all the time of what other people think and like finding them in this strange position when their daughter Annie Ono be starts to become like a really educated young woman and how they differ like in ways of speaking and language and how language can almost be violent when um, when you're in a certain social class or status and there's kind of language, like French language that, it, that belongs to a different, a higher class. Um, and so what that means like inside the family is kind of awareness of like the envy and jealousy of others, but also the just constant feeling of inadequacy and trying to run from that shame or to to all the time appear as, um, as a higher social class than you are. The ending specifically kind of takes you to like present day of when she's writing this book and she's bringing her two and a half year old son to visit her parents. She's since been married and moved kind of into a higher social class and she lives in a much wealthier place. Um, and she goes back to, I don't know, introduce her son to her parents. And it's exactly around the time that her father passes away in his late sixties. That was really moving and touching like the last seven pages or something that really touched me and um it was a really beautiful heartfelt way to finish the book so i leave it feeling like that was really nice there's a really interesting sentence she writes here now i have finished unearthing the legacy which i had to leave at the door when i entered the educated bourgeois world several months had passed since i started this narrative last november 
It has taken me a long time because I find it is far more difficult to dig up forgotten memories than it is to invent them. Memory resists. I could not rely on personal reminiscence. The squeaky doorbell of an old grocer's shop and the smell of overripe melons would lead me to picture only myself and my summer holidays. The color of the sky and the poplar trees reflected in the river could teach me nothing. It was in other people that I searched for the figure of my father, in the way they would call their children, sit down and look bored, in waiting rooms and wave goodbye on station platforms. Anonymous figures glimpsed on a street corner or on a crowded bus, unwittingly bearing the stamp of success or failure, brought me back to the reality of his condition. I thought it was really beautiful that she kind of searches for her father and his the portrait of his life and the memory of him in other men and other fathers that she sees in the world. So that was quite an interesting kind of pairing. Books about fathers and I've obviously been with my my own father this uh, Christmas season and so that was nice like to just reflect on our relationship and to think about his life. Um, yeah, so these are very similar. They're very similar themes. Now I can't find it, but there was like one sentence in here about like the violence of language or something um, that like I feel like I've read almost the same sentence by Edward Louis. Like I can feel um, his influence from her. Nice to kind of theme reading this week. Still reading the Daphne du Maurier. I'm gonna go now. Thank you for watching this video. Do you like my new pajamas? I start puppies so much, so I hope you remember who we are. Thank you for watching. Bye.